All right. <clears throat> well, today we had an interesting little situation at church where the audio from the sermon did not get recorded. And so I am going to just, in a little bit of a different setting, we're going to go ahead and go through the same content that we went through at church so that whether you were able to be there or not, if you were able to be there and you wanted to hear the content again or be able to review it, fill in your notes, catch something that maybe you missed in church, you'll have that opportunity. But if you weren't able to be there or you're someone that kind of watches uh, our sermons from afar, you won't miss uh, kind of this installment in the series. And so uh, that's my heart is that we able to just make it available to you. And so um, it may not be um, quite what you're used to. Maybe you'll like it more. Uh, maybe you won't like it quite as much. But I think in the end, it's definitely going to be better than nothing. And so um, I'm setting the bar really high for myself in order for uh, this to you know, be successful. But um, Anyways, uh, we're, we're going into uh, session number two in our series called TLC Values. Uh, obviously, our church is called the Lumberton Church, and the, uh, the initials of that is TLC. And so we are TLC Values. We want to talk about some, not all. It is not an exhaustive sermon series covering all of the things that we value. But it is four top ones that we are talking about. Last week, we talked about TLC values worship. This week, we are talking about TLC values prayer. And then next week, we're going to be talking about TLC values community and family. And then fourthly and lastly for the series, we're going to talk about TLC values the Holy Spirit. And so I hope that I hope you'll join us in that process. So today is TLC Values Prayer. We're going to talk a little bit about prayer, what it is, and a couple of different points that I want to cover as far as the, the nature of prayer. And I think it will be good and fun and uh, hopefully helpful. And so I'm actually just going to open in prayer and then we'll jump right in. And so Lord Jesus, thank you God for today. Thank you for the opportunity for us, Lord, to be able to interact with your word together. Lord, I pray that you would bless it. I pray, God, Holy Spirit, you would come and make it alive to us, that it would be a rhema word from the Holy Spirit and not just not just engaged with the written word, but that, God, we would be impacted by the breathed on, the spirit breathed on, brought to life word of God burning in our hearts. So, Lord, we thank you for who you are. What an amazing, amazing God you are. Pray you'd bless this time together, um, even though it's a little unusual how we're getting together. Lord, we know that you can still use it in a big way. So we pray you would, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. We're going to start out in Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19 and verse 46. And it says, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer. And that's Jesus speaking about his house, that his house should be called a house of prayer. So we want the Lumberton Church to be a house of prayer. We don't just want the Lumberton Church to be a house of prayer. We want that the people in the church to be a people of prayer. That we are just defined as prayer being one of the main things that makes us tick. That we are a people of prayer. It is a house of prayer. Because you know what? Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that try to build it. We want to make sure that we are aligned with the things God wants to do, and that we are filled with His power, that we are walking in relationship with Him. So first, as we dive in, we're going to talk first and foremost, just like what, what is prayer? And so I'm so glad you asked. Um, the, just a, a brief de definition of prayer. Uh, it's communication with God, primarily offered in the second person voice, addressing God directly, may include petition, entreaty, supplication, thanksgiving, praise, hymns, and lament. And uh, so I, I gave this little quote. Uh, this is for me right here. So you can write it down if you want. And, uh, and prayer starts with surrender. It is maintained by humility, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and multiplied by agreement, demonstrating our faith in a great God all along. So, 
now we need to ask ourselves, like, why prayer? And what in the world is prayer? Why is it necessary? And so with that, I want to just read some introductory thoughts on prayer out of the Tyndall Bible Dictionary. I just found some of this content just to be um, insightful and helpful. Um, So here we go. Newly created humans, Adam and Eve, made for fellowship with God, lived in close communion with him. But sin broke this intimate, direct relationship. Nevertheless, when the Lord formed his covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, the relationship between the covenant partners was open again. Abraham's prayer for Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 18 of Genesis is a striking combination of boldness and persistence and is a recognition of his own smallness and inferiority compared to God. The same could be said about Jacob's wrestling with the angel at Peniel. But boldness and directness are not to be confused with familiarity. Biblical prayer is characterized by the reality that there is a distance between the creator and the creature. Primarily due to human sin, bridged only by God's grace. Bridged only by God's grace. The basis of a person's approach to God in prayer is never simply man's search for God, but God's gracious initiative. The establishing of the covenant and the promise of help and deliverance on the basis of that covenant. It is this covenant relationship that gives the warrant for prayer. Thus, in patriarchal times, Prayer was conjoined with sacrifice and obedience. And we'll continue on. Uh, Prayer in the New Testament. Uh, The New Testament's teaching on prayer is dominated by Christ's own example and teaching. His dependence on his Father in his mediatorial work expresses itself in repeated prayer, culminating in his high priestly prayer in John 17, the agony of Gethsemane with the prayer on the cross, And uh, his teaching on prayer, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, is to be understood as contrasted with the Jewish practices at the time, not with uh, Old Testament ideals. Prayer is an expression of sincere desire. It is not to inform God of matters that he would have otherwise been ignorant of. And the validity of prayer is not affected by length or rep. uh, Repetitiveness is the word. Uh, Private prayer is to be discreet and secret. Uh, So just really enjoyed um, a a third source of teaching in the Lord's Prayer uh, is the Lord's Prayer. Once again, even in the Lord's Prayer, there's a blend of directness in referring to God as our Father, and yet also a distance, uh, who art in heaven and hallowed be thy name recognizing the position that where God really is. And I think that that is a super critical point. So as we review those, those uh, comments, those uh, pieces of information, three words that really stuck out to me was humility, boldness, and directness. Um, just we want to be bold and direct and like we need to come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. We need to not shrink back. We need to be courageous about it. But we also need to come to the throne of the God of the universe who created heaven and earth. We need to, we need to come with humility. We need, to remember, we need to remember who he is and who we are and how those two pieces come together. The requests given in the Lord's Prayer are concerned first with God and his kingdom and his glory. And then with the disciples' needs for forgiveness and for daily support and deliverance. Occasionally, it will seem from our Lord's teaching that anything that is prayed for uh, will, without restriction, be granted. But such teaching ought to be understood in the light of Christ's overall teaching about prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So therefore, prayer is kingdom-oriented. It's an important point there. The Christian's prayer is rooted objectively in Christ's intercession, subjectively in the enabling of the Holy Spirit, and the church is a kingdom of priests offering spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. But Christ is the great high priest. So we're going to talk about some scriptures on prayer. Colossians 4.2 Devote yourselves to prayer 
stay alert in it with thanksgiving. Colossians 4.2, Jude 20 through 23. But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, expecting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything but in everything through prayer. Don't worry about anything but in everything through prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God and the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Come on now. And the Ephesians 3, 11 through 12. And this is kind of just talking about that boldness piece. This, according to his eternal purpose, accomplished in the Messiah, Jesus our Lord. In him, we have boldness and confident access. Boldness and confident access we have in him through faith in him. And then we've got Ephesians 6, 18 and 19. Ephesians 6, 18 and 19. Pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray at all times in the spirit, people. That's what he's saying right there. Pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert. In verse 19, it says, pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. So man, please be praying for me as I'm preaching the word every Sunday in church that the word would be accurate, that the word would be powerful, that the word would be clear, that the word would be effective, all those kinds of things. Pray, pray, pray. Jeremiah 29, 12 through 14. You will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. Come on. I will be found by you. That's the Lord's declaration to you that you are, you are going to find him. Come on now. What a, what a humongous blessing that truth of scripture is for us. Matthew 7, 7 through 11, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asked for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a snake? If then you are who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more... Ask yourself that question right now. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? How much more? And I think that those verses are so critical because the, a big aspect of prayer is who you're praying to. So we need to be familiar with the character of the one that we're praying to so that we approach with the right attitude, approach with the right expectations, or approach with the right hopes. He is the one that gives good gifts to his kids. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. If Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they should pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will restore him to health. If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. That's a whole verse for another sermon right there. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. So that you may be healed. The urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Let's read that again. The urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three and a half years, it did not rain on the land. 
Then he prayed again and the sky gave rain and the land produced its fruit. Wow. All right, now I've got 12 points and I know that sounds like a lot. I want you to take a deep breath. We're not going to sit and belabor the points, but I feel like all of them are pretty important that I just want to mention as we go through. That way you can kind of, you can have it in your notes. You could reflect on it. You could even pray through it and ask the Lord to just kind of flesh it out a little bit for you, help you understand all the pieces. First point, point number one, prayer is a gift made possible by Christ. It's not a duty. It's a gift. It's not a have to. It's a get to. It's, it's not even a task that needs to be accomplished. It's a person that we need to meet with. And so I want to make sure that just from the very get-go, like, I think that we're probably, you know, one of the most kind of prayerless nations out there, right? Like, I don't know, America is very just dependent on ourselves, doing our own thing and being busy, busy, busy. And I think at times the Lord's like, man, slow down and let me be. Let me do some of the things you think you have to do. Number two, prayer is necessary and expected, not optional. Matthew chapter six, the disciples come to Jesus and they're like, oh Lord, teach us to pray. And I love it. He looks at me and says, when you pray, he doesn't say if, he doesn't say if you consider it, you know, if it pops up in your mind, you know, whatever. He says, when you pray, because I know you're going to pray, like, no, duh, you're going to pray. Of course, you're going to pray because it's so critical to your relationship with me. Uh, Just like I've modeled, like Jesus modeled the relationship with his father going, breaking away for time of prayer. Pretty much every day, it looks like in scripture, he was making time to go spend with the father. So prayer is necessary and expected, not optional. So is fasting. I mean, fasting is really presented in the same exact way. When you fast, do it this way. And so I know that's something definitely us at TLC, we're going to make a point uh, to make sure that we are taking time to pray and fast at times. And I know that that's everybody's favorite thing, especially here in the South. We love to fast. That's not true at all. Actually, that was a lie. Um, So point number three, prayer is relational. In uh, John chapter 15, talks about God being the vine and uh, we are the branches. The Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. We need to be connected into the vine and that is done predominantly through prayer. Being willing to slow down, stop what we're doing, connect with him, talk to him, listen to him, listen to him, listen to him, right? You have, you have one mouth and you have two ears. So maybe we should do twice as much listening as we do speaking. And if we understand verse six of John chapter 15, if anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire and they're burnt. There is no fruit. Verse five is really where I wanted to go there. Jesus says, I'm the vine. You're the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do a little bit. No, you can do nothing without Jesus. So this relational piece of prayer is just critical. Because we've got to connect with the Lord in order to have any sort of hope or prayer to accomplish the things that God's called us to. Number four, prayer is encounter with someone specific and therefore is grounded in scripture. Prayer is not a thing to do. This is point number five. Prayer is not a thing to do, but it is a person to know. I got a couple of Tim Keller quotes here. Prayer is a conversation with God that leads to encounter with God. I think that's a great expectation for us to have as we go into prayer. It starts as a conversation with him, but it leads to an encounter with him. Prayer turns theology into experience. Have you ever met people that are just full, full, full of theology and the Bible, and yet just seem so dry and cracked and hard and you know, not full of life. Well, that can be part of it is maybe, maybe they're lacking that relational prayer aspect. 
I really liked this point uh, in this Tim, this next Tim Keller quote. Left to ourselves, we will pray to some God who speaks what we like hearing or to the part of God we manage to understand. But what is critical is that we speak to the God who speaks to us and to everything that he speaks to us. There is a difference between praying to an unknown God whom we hope to discover in our praying and praying to a known God revealed through Israel and Jesus Christ who speaks our language. In the first, we indulge our appetite for religious fulfillment. In the second, we practice obedient faith. The first is a lot more fun. The second is a lot more important. What is essential in prayer is not that we learn to express ourselves, but that we learn to answer God. Prayer is simply continuing a conversation that God has already started through his word and his grace, which eventually becomes a full-on encounter with him. Number six, prayer is personal and it is also corporate. I want to make sure that we recognize the personal piece of it, but also the corporate piece because both are important to this walk. In the family of God, we are not called as Lone Ranger Christians. We are called to we are called together. We are the called out ones. Prayer is personal, but it is also corporate. We want to make sure that we get both of those going on. Prayer is evidence of faith because it is an act of faith. What do we mean by this? Well, we've been talking the last couple of weeks about our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When we're talking about the armor of God, we talk about the shoes We talk about just faith in general. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So, gosh, I better have some kind of idea of what faith is because I want to please God. I want to serve God. I want to know God. So what in the world is faith? Faith is acting like what you believe about God is true. That means If you believe that prayer is powerful and that prayer heals the sick, then you are going to pray a lot and you're going to pray for the sick a lot because you're going to believe that those things happen. If, however, you tell me that you believe these things, that prayer is powerful and that people are healed by prayer, but you never pray for sick people and you never kind of just pray in general, I'm going to have to surmise, I'm going to have to interpret, I'm going to have to believe then that you don't believe that prayer is powerful or you're mean and hateful, one or the other, right? Because if you believe, truly, 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 truly believe in your heart, for sure, 100% that prayer heals and that prayer is powerful and that prayer accomplishes much and yet you don't pray, but it's not because you don't believe it, then you're a meanie head and you need to be corrected in Jesus' name. Like, man, what is that all about? If you believe those things, you should do those things. Number seven, prayer is evidence of faith because it is an act of faith. Prayer is an evidence of faith because it is an act of faith. And I already read that one. I just realized I just read it again, but it's because it's so important. It also brings up this point about the difference between belief and behavior and that there needs to not be a gap in your life and in my life between what we say we believe and what we are doing, because that is distance is what we call self-deception. And I don't want any of you to be self-deceived. I don't want any of you to be running around thinking one thing and and then doing another thing. We want to be consistent people of integrity, people of faith, walking out the things that we say we believe. Number eight, Prayer is all in. Number eight, prayer is all in. You will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all, everybody say all of my heart. When I search for him with all of my heart, that's when we find him. Prayer 
is an all-in endeavor. Number nine, prayer is powerful. We just talked about that. Uh, James chapter five, the healing of the sick and the restoring of broken things. So uh, prayer is powerful. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. And just like in Matthew 17, when the disciples went out to cast out demons and people and they came back and they're like, whoa, Jesus, man, these guys did some awesome stuff. Man, we had some problems and they couldn't solve them. And Jesus said, well, you know, some of these things don't come out except but by prayer and fasting. So sometimes there's some spiritual enemies that we face that are so bulky or their strongholds are so secure. There's an element of prayer and fasting that needs to come into play in order to break those things apart. Prayer is powerful. Number 10, prayer is consistent, persistent, and persevering. Persistent, consistent, and persevering. Where do I get this? Well, out of Matthew chapter 7, 7 through 11. And ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. The Greek tense of the verb there is actually, it indicates ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. And that's when these doors are going to be open to you. Why is that? Well, partly I think because God wants to develop in us something powerful, something amazing. And so it takes sometimes time and dedication and perseverance. Like something happens in us when we commit to walking something out, when we commit to persevering through something, when we don't demand uh, instant gratification on something. Prayer is consistent, persistent, and persevering. And then Numbers 11 and number 12 kind of go together. Prayer is discipline, discipline, but prayer is also delight. It starts as discipline, right? Because it's kind of like if you're going to go on a date with someone for the first time, you're a little nervous. How's it going to go? What's it going to be like? What do they want to talk about? What if I don't have anything to talk about? Oh my gosh. And you get yourself all kind of stressed out. You get kind of anxious. You get kind of worried and it's because you don't know them, but you then you, you spend the first date and man, it goes really well. You're really enjoying hanging out with each other. Well, then the next date is not so much of a dis- discipline, then it becomes a little bit more of a delight. You get to know them a little bit better, a little bit more common ground, a little bit more familiarity. And now there is even more like ease, more delight in this process. And that's the way it's going to work in our relationship with God. So you might be sitting there today and you've never really engaged in quite the prayer life that you think you should. And I'm here to tell you that it's going to be work up front, but that as you continue on, as you give yourself to the work, it's going to get better because we're going to get to know him. We are going to grow in our love for him. We are going to follow hard after him. It's going to be Awesome. So prayer is discipline and prayer is delight. Come on now. So as we have reviewed all of these points, I'm just wondering, asking you today to think about what is one of the points that sticks out the most to you, that one that you want to dig into. Where in your life are you having that belief and behavior gap where that what you're doing isn't lining up with what you say you believe? And what can we begin to do about that, specifically in the arena of prayer? And I just want to close today by praying for you that whatever God is laying on your heart, that there would just be grace to take that next step, that faith action. We're going to take that faith action and move forward in whatever, even if it's the tiniest little thing, any progress is better than no progress. So Father God, right now we come to you Lord today with all the stuff we have talked about today. I pray God that you would speak to our hearts, each of us individually, every single person that has watched this video, you would speak something directly to their hearts, Lord God, that they would be able to Uh, identify one thing that you really want them to grow in and change in. 
because God, we know that your plans for us are good to give us a hope and a future. And so we pray, God, that you would do something, speak a specific word in each of our hearts today that we could respond in obedience and walk it out in faith. We thank you, God, for all of this right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, God bless y'all. Have a great week. I appreciate you being here. And thank. Let, hey, drop in the comments what you think about this format. And uh, appreciate uh, appreciate you being here. Appreciate you watching. God bless you and have a great day.